Hey, everybody. Hope you had a nice Thanksgiving break. Uh, we're on now to um, Thomas More's Utopia. Um, after Utopia, we have to read Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare's The Tempest, and then uh, 1960s um, rewriting of The Tempest called A Tempest. And that will, um, that will bring us to the end of the semester. So we're getting there. Um, as always, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Thomas More, who he was, a really fascinating person, um, and some background information. As always, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, book one of uh, Utopia, which actually um, kind of sets the stage for book two. Book two is 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 the main discussion of this place called Utopia. Um, and um, book one uh, kind of describes um, where the ideas come from, some conversations that, uh, that are had, um, it give you a sense for what some of the issues are gonna be that are discussed in Utopia in book two. Um, so I'll talk about book one, um, and I think that you'll find that helpful uh, for reading book two. It is a little strange. Um, uh, in the way that it, it really starts out as a, a letter, essentially. Uh, and I know that can be a little confusing. So I'll, I'll try to make sure that I clarify that as best I can. Um, so um, Thomas More was born in 1478. And I'll have a picture here. Um, this is, this is the, the main picture you'll find um, from a painting of, of Moore himself. Um, born in 1478 in London, England, died in June 6, 1535, at the age of 57, also in London, England. Um, and um, he was um, an English humanist. So he was really interested in issues of you know, human nature, what is human nature like, human interests and human values. And again, he was doing this from a kind of Christian perspective. So in, in certain ways, um, he was uh, an offshoot or maybe building on some of the same ideas that Boethius was dealing with much earlier um, in the Middle Ages. Um, obviously, Moore's writing after that point um, and from um, um, just looking through things from a slightly different lens than, than Boethius did. Um, Moore's writing at a time where there's much more, you know, we have the arts have recovered uh, with the Renaissance and all aspects of culture and writing and, and education and all these kind of things. So he's very much writing in a different era than Boethius did. Um, uh, there were a number of, you know, relatively well-known um, English humanists. There was actually an English humanist circle that, that um, Moore was a part of. Um, and he really represents, however, the kind of political and spiritual disorder of the, uh, the, the time that's known as the Reformation, right? This is the, um, the Protestant Reformation, as it's often called, uh, spurred by Martin Luther, um, when um, you had um, shifts in allegiances taking place, um, allegiances between the political leadership um, and in this case, it's really Henry VIII that's, who's front and center here. Um, and those people in the church, the leaders in the church. And we know what an important role the Catholic Church had played historically and the relationship between the Catholic Church and the political leadership. We talked about that in terms of, of, of Rome, uh, the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church, you know, for example. And... Um, as the Protestant Reformation starts to take place and uh, starts to kind of replace in some places, in some ways, Roman Catholic traditions, um, there was obviously a lot of unrest and disorder that that created and more kind of got caught up in that. Um, um, and we'll, we'll see how in just a minute. Um, when he died in 1535, it was because he was actually beheaded uh, for being against the religious policy of um, Henry VIII. Um, um, where Henry VIII really saw an opportunity with the Protestant Reformation um, to kind of claim for himself um, 
the opportunity to be the supreme head of the Church of England, right? So uh, no longer having to worry about potential conflicts between um, the, the monarchy and the church by bringing those things together uh, to have a more kind of a supreme autocratic sort of power um, that Henry VIII wanted to have. Um, so more kind of got caught up in this. Um, there's actually um, a, a movie that's made about Moore's life um, and about his really his refusal to um, come out and speak against the Catholic Church and on behalf of the Church of England of Henry VIII um, um, came out, I think it was 1966, in fact, um, called A Man for All Seasons, a really excellent movie that really shows um, um, this is this is obviously from, from a, um, a poster from the movie, um, really shows his devotion to his faith, to his Catholic faith. Um, and his, his unwillingness to, um, to go against his, his beliefs and the fact that he was willing to die for his beliefs. Um, he is, uh, was eventually again known as, as um, St. Thomas More. He was canonized by the Pope in 1935, took quite a while, but eventually was sort of recognized um, for you know, the sacrifice he has made and what he represented. Uh, both at the time and certainly historically. Um, this was a pretty popular movie when it, when it, it came out. Um, Orson Welles, a number of other, um, John Hurt, other well-known um, actors in this movie. So um, if you're interested at all in, in some of this history and in Moore's life, um, you might enjoy seeing that movie. I remember watching it. it used to be on, if I remember correctly, uh, frequently around Easter when I was growing up as a kid. Um, so um, that's, you know, some important element of, um, of the background of, um, of Moore. Um, maybe that's the wrong picture. Let me get to the right picture here a second. Um, so his early life. So as I mentioned, he was born in London in 1478 to John and Agnes Moore. Um, his families were really collected to the legal community. Um, and his father, John Moore, really wanted very much to be a part of the, uh, of the lawyers club uh, known as Lincoln's Inn. He was a butler there for a time um, and you know, very, wanted to be a lawyer himself, wanted to have that, a career. And that opportunity came um, when he um, married Agnes Granger, who would obviously become Agnes more later on, Agnes Granger, no relation as far as I know, uh, who was the wealthy daughter of a local merchant. And she shared some of her wealth with, with John Moore, Thomas's father. Um, and eventually he was admitted to the bar, um, uh, a group of practicing lawyers, um, and also had uh, four other children besides Thomas, three of them died very young. Uh, again, which was not uncommon at the time. Um, there was, um, it was obviously, um, you know, medical care and when dealing with disease and other kinds of childhood illnesses or infant illnesses, there wasn't really much they could do in those cases uh, um, um, to really, you know, take care of, of young people. Um, and um, so that was not uncommon for, you know, to lose um, that many children. It was one reason that, that, um, that people often had large families. Another was for economic purposes, but certainly because many of them would, um, would perish when they were very young. Um, Moore's early education began at a prominent London school called St. Anthony's. And then in 1490, he entered the household of Archbishop John Morton, who was a close advisor to Henry VII, not Henry VIII, but Henry VII. Um, and that made all kinds of great connections for Thomas More and for his family. Um, and um, um, Archbishop John More is actually mentioned in book one of Utopia. And in a little while, I'll, I'll kind of describe how that happens. Um, in 1492, so at about age 14, More transferred to Oxford, um, where he began his Greek study. So he was well 
um, he could read and write in, in Greek and in Latin, um, which was obviously the language he was going to be using to write his texts. Um, and then he kind of went back to um, London to begin his own um, political career. Um, and by, nine, by, eight, by 1498, he had actually begun his own membership in, in Lincoln's End. So he kind of found, he followed in the, the footsteps of his father. Um, so I mentioned there was this circle of, of humanists or Christian humanists uh, that Moore was really a part of, uh, this kind of humanist circle um, in the early um, 1500s. Um, another very famous member of that circle uh, or of the, of the Christian humanists, uh, another writer um, whose picture I mistakenly put up a minute ago was Erasmus. He made, that may be a name you're familiar with. Um, Erasmus wrote a, a book called In Praise of Folly about human nature. Um, and in trying to recognize all the different facets of, of human nature. And I, as I said previously, you could see Boethius was sort of trying, starting to embrace some of these ideas. Um, and now we have a, a much more developed kind of version of, of this, this, this humanism with Moore and um, Erasmus. Um, but he was another important part of this. And definitely you can see, um, if you know Erasmus' work well, um, um, his ideas in, in, in Moore's work. Um, so another figure from the time who was kind of working with a similar set of ideas was Erasmus. Um, so that, that, that the kind of philosophy behind that kind of, um, again, like, um, like Boethius, kind of combined a study of the gospel and the church with, uh, especially in this case, Greek philosophy. And here again, we see the influence of Aristotle and, and Plato, um, and Plato in particular here. Um, you can see why um, Plato and Aristotle are so important historically, why they're read so often, um, and why they're such the focus uh, in, you know, in the humanities and a requirement in our humanities um, you know, class at, um, at Geneseo um, because of, of the great influence that they had for hundreds of years after they lived. And, and again, even in ways today, you can see a, a great deal of the influence of both Plato and Aristotle as well in Thomas Jefferson and in his ideas about education uh, public education in particular that he wrote about um, in Virginia. Um, so I just wanted to, to make sure that you see that that thread of influence really winds its way through um, through all the things that we have been reading. Um, Moore spent some time actually with the strict Cartesian monks. He was considering um, a, a life um, as a member of the clergy for a time. And then I think he kind of decided that he could still fulfill a Christian call to ministry as a layman, as a, as a non-member of the, of the clergy. And he certainly did that um, in his life. Um, he um, first married a woman named Jane Colt. Uh, they had three sons and a daughter. She then passed away, unfortunately, in 1511, uh, at which time he married Alice Middleton. And at this, at this time, his legal career was really growing. He became in 1511, uh, London's under sheriff. So he kind of performed the legal functions of, of, of the sheriff, um, making sure that uh, things were followed through on laws, policies, decrees, et cetera. Um, and this gave him additional work and income as a public lawyer um, until he eventually made his way into, into Henry VIII's court. Um, where he worked as um, a representative to foreign merchants. Um, and that was really the opportunity that he had that, um, that, that gave him to write Utopia. So in 1515, he was, um, took a trip to an embassy in, in Antwerp, which is now in, in Belgium. It was known as Flanders at the time. Um, and um, while he was doing this, um, while he was trying to kind of work out trade deals with foreign merchants and things, there was a lot of travel that was involved. Um, and um, messages had to be sent back and forth, you know, between um, these embassy representatives and their government, et cetera. And while he was waiting for some of this all to take place, 
um, is when he wrote Utopia. Um, in some ways, it's definitely modeled after Plato's Republic, which I know I've referenced multiple occasions, um, um, which um, was written, um, you know, almost, um, you know, roughly speaking, you know, 2000 years earlier. Um, it was eventually published in 1516 and uh, describes an imaginary land free of prideful greed and violence uh, that were a part really of the English scenes that, that Moore had witnessed, things that he saw in his lifetime, um, social issues, social problems that he sort of witnessed. Um, and in some ways it's like Plato's Republic, in some ways it's not like Plato's Republic. Um, it does offer a vision of an ideal society, presumably. However, um, Plato wrote the re his Republic um, with the idea that it was kind of a blueprint for an ideal society that was not achievable, but that could give people something to kind of work towards, right? Give them a, a vision to work towards something that would allow them to maybe even think relatively radically about what society might be like, how it might be different than the society, right, of Plato's own day. And we know how both Plato, Aristotle, as well as Socrates were concerned with political arrangements, et cetera, um, in their own day. Um, so it was not achievable, nonetheless, you know, as a utopia. Uh, utopia means no place. So it kind of suggests the fact that it's ultimately not achievable, it doesn't really exist and, and probably couldn't exist. But it, it, gave, it gave you that sort of, um, that ideal. And remember Plato worked in the, the realm of ideas and ideals to kind of work towards. Um, utopia of Thomas Morse is, is, is different in that um, it, it's not offering in the same sense as a blueprint to try to work towards. I think it's, it's, it operates more as just something to, to give you a radically different picture of what society might be like. Um, not that you would want to try to adapt all the aspects of this society, um, but that it would um, kind of make you realize that things could be different. We could have different laws. We could have a different social arrangements. We could have different economic arrangements. We could have different educational arrangements, et cetera. Um, and um, in doing that as well, um, as I, I previously mentioned, um, you could at least think about ways of addressing some of the social problems and issues that Moore saw in his own day. The, the social problems that are raised and the issues that come up in book one and book two, um, we believe are really things that Thomas More was concerned with and, and, and other humanists of the day were concerned with. Um, greed, violence, et cetera. Um, however, Moore's utopia um, was not written to offer Moore's vision of how to appropriately address those social problems. Some of the ideas might do that, some of them might not. Um, and what I, what I mean by that is that we shouldn't assume that everything that is presented in the book as supposedly utopian and the description of this utopian society that more necessarily agreed with. So keep your eyes open for places where in the discussion, it sounds like more is skeptical, incredulous, uh, maybe even critical of some of the aspects of this utopian society that's being described. Um, and that maybe he is, a, you know, um, he doesn't necessarily agree with all of these things. Too many people, I think, read the utopia as things that Moore really did agree with 100%, that they were um, actually his vision of what a utopian society would look like. And I think that's really problematic. And if you read closely, you can see that the Moore character in the book, um, as, as the author Moore is kind of describing himself and being involved in this sort of fictional conversation um, about this place called Utopia, that um, you can see that, again, he doesn't agree with everything. He has some questions that aren't answered. Uh, he seems, again, skeptical of certain things. Um, there are some things that appear sort of outrageous um, um, about this place called Utopia, that it's hard to imagine somebody of deep faith, a Catholic like Moore, would necessarily agree with. And that's because I think um, 
they're not necessarily things that, that Thomas More himself agreed with. So um, even though Plato's utopia is in some sense written perhaps as Plato's actual belief in what an ideal society would look like, More's utopia, I don't think should be read that way. Maybe some of the ideas could be adapted or at least in part. Um, some of them seem like they could be really problematic. And again, I think More himself probably believed that. Um, but they, they do give you a different lens through which to kind of view society through and society's institutions. And also as the date, they help to bring to light these social problems that, that Moore was very much concerned with. So um, that's really important, I think, in, in, in how we read the book. Um, so I mentioned Moore's service under Henry VIII. Um, one of the discussions that they get into in the book is the difficulties of, is, of, of being a counselor to, uh, to princes and to kings. Um, and um, this is something that, uh, that Thomas More had sort of experience with himself, especially when he had a falling out with Henry the, the Eighth um, and with the monarchy. Um, and, um, but he did get, um, initially um, didn't accept invitations to serve under Henry the Eighth, but eventually he agreed to do so. Um, and um, this was in 1517 and did have a career as a diplomat, as I mentioned, uh, particularly as a court representative with foreign merchants. So he worked with the legal service and with finance. Um, and in 1529, he was chosen as chancellor of, of England, who was essentially um, a secretary of the king. Um, however, his doubts about serving um, the king, serving the monarchy, uh, I, I think, um, started to prove justified um, when he first promoted a war tax that was very unpopular and um, it had to be uh, discontinued. This was when he was um, um, Speaker of the House in 1523 and um, maybe started to see that, that um, there were going to be some at least tensions, difficulties, challenges with um, doing what he really believed was the right thing to do. We're having to make tough political decisions. And, and of course, promoting taxes and raising taxes is obviously one that's not going to make you very popular. Um, but he eventually did rise to, again, to, um, to the, um, the office of, uh, of secretary of the king. Um, <clears throat> But as the the um, as England as as Henry VIII started to sever these ties with Rome and the Catholic Church, um, More was put in an even more difficult situation. Um, he did engage in writings against Lutherans, and defended and, and really defended the fundamental rules of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, though he knew that it had its own defects, um, just as Dante did and was concerned with certain aspects of the church. Um, um, so, you know, somebody who had a real kind of moral center that put him in the position to be critical both of um, the uh, Reformation and Lutheranism as it was developing and as well as the Catholic church. Um, and there was quite a bit of violence that happened against uh, Protestants uh, during the Protestant Reformation. Um, there, I remember to read the Perry chapter. I forget what the, exactly which number it is. that goes along with this reading, um, and it'll discuss a lot of the the uprisings, a lot of the violence uh, that this created, um, and you'll see that as well um, evidenced in the PowerPoint that goes with that chapter. Um, so um, he continued writing until a year after he finally resigned from office um, in 1532 and really fell into illness. It really was you know, great distress over England's separation from the, the Catholic Church. Um, and he definitely realized that the dangers that his, his writings on behalf of the Catholic Church were going to bring him this kind of upside down world of, of Henry's break from Rome. Um, he tried to avoid political controversy, um, but ultimately was unable to do so. He was pressed by Henry VIII to publicly acknowledge the country's break from Rome in 1534, and he, he just refused to do that. Um, here's one of the, the um, best known 
pictures of um, Henry VIII that you might recognize. Um, and um, there was also an, an oath that denied the Pope's power in England. And that was something that Moore just really could not do. Um, so he was um, put in the, in the Tower of London. He was put on trial um, in um, 1534 and um, essentially for treason, for betraying his country. Um, there were certain people who, um, to, to, to make the charge that much more severe, kind of lied against him and were saying that he was doing things against the state, um, against the government that he really wasn't doing, just to, to make things you know, look even worse on his behalf. Um, and he was finally executed, and as, as some of you might remember, Henry VIII's favorite method of execution was beheading. Uh, so he was beheaded in, again, 1535. Um, and um, he really, again, resisted you know, to his death, um, the effort to move his, uh, remove his loyalty. He said he, you know, he remained, remained lawyer, loyal to England, uh, even though he could not follow this break from the Catholic Church. Um, and again, which would have put Henry VIII as, as head of, supreme head of the Church of England and given him supreme power, you know, ultimately. Um, because of, again, of his deep faith. Um, I mentioned uh, the Protestant Reformation and, and Luther. Um, the picture I'm, I'm um, sharing here is, I believe, the same from the same uh, painting that is in the PowerPoint in the Perry text of, of Martin Luther. Um, you can see that they're all wearing this basically the same kind of headwear that was sort of popular at the time. Um, if you um, if you see um, film versions of, for example, some of Shakespeare's work and, and other work in this general time period, you'll see this, this same kind of garb. But that's, that's a, a painting of a uh, famous painting of um, Martin Luther. So um, we have this, again, background material giving us a sense for who Thomas More was, his life, um, some background on utopia. And now I'm going to go a little more in detail about uh, book one, um, some of the things I've mentioned previously to um, you know, give you a little more detail here. Some of it may have been a little confusing, so I want to make sure to clarify. Um, so um, book one of Utopia is, you know, it really begins with this letter of Moore's or the Moore character to Peter Giles. Right? Peter Giles actually did exist. He was a real living person. Uh, he was another humanist friend of, of Moore's, part of this humanist circle. And um, so he really did exist. And it was uh, Moore or Moore's character and Giles that had this discussion with this person named Raphael Heisleide, who was a fictional person. He didn't really exist. But they met this person and he described for them this place called Utopia that he visited and which Heisleide was very much promoting. And, and Heisleday certainly believes that the uto this utopia was utopian in every sense of the word. And you can tell in the way he talks about it that he, he completely believes in it. He lived there for a time, et cetera. Um, and again, he's fictional, he doesn't actually exist. And um, a little tip off um, here, and uh, Moore did this with many of the people's names and the place names in Utopia. And um, the, this word utopia, as we know of it, actually does come from Moore's work. It doesn't come, it doesn't go all the way back to Plato's Republic. Um, um, after Moore's utopia, et cetera, people started looking back at the, Plato's Republic as a utopia um, and, and saw it as, as uh, that kind of, uh, as a part of utopian literature, but it wasn't sort of viewed so at the, at the time that Plato wrote it. Um, but again, utopia means no place. Right, um, Raphael Heifelde, his first name Raphael means God's healer, somebody that does good works. Heifelde means peddler of nonsense. 
and that starts to give us this, you know, the sense, this idea of 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 um, Haifa Day um, as uh, peddling nonsense is saying things that are not true. It's talking about a place that doesn't really exist. Now, whether or not whether or not um, you can take that to mean that Moore is trying to tip us off that what he's talking about is nonsense. That this utopia um, could never exist. That that it is flawed um, is debatable. Um, but certainly, you can just read the fact that he's a peddler of nonsense in that he's talking about a place that doesn't really exist. Um, but again, it, it, it might tip us off to the fact that Moore's not necessarily agreeing with everything he's hearing from Raphael Heifleday about this place that was supposedly a utopia. Um, so um, this is essentially what we get in, in book one. Moore is writing to Peter Giles and saying, you'll remember we had this discussion with Raphael Heifleday and he talked about this incredible place called Utopia and um, I've actually tried to um, go back and um, put down on paper what he told us, his description of this utopian society. And um, I want you to look it over and make sure that I got everything accurate and everything correct. And it's sort of interesting because the one thing he gives as an example is something having to do, I believe, with the length of, of a bridge, whether he got that correct um, a really minor issue, right? Um, when there's this larger issue looming of whether or not this utopia could ever exist and whether or not indeed it is, it is utopian, whether or not it really is an ideal kind of, of place. So that's sort of an interesting kind of literary uh, device that, that, that sort of more uses here. Um, a very simple, relatively meaningless issue um, when in fact, um, they're much more important issues um, that are much more you know, debatable, having to do with politics, economics, it, it, you know, the military, et cetera, that actually are being discussed in the book. Um, but before Heifle Day talked about this place called Utopia, um, they got into a discussion of, um, of justice, questions of justice and of law, of punishment in England as they existed in England at the time. And Heisler Day starts telling them that he believes that um, ideas of, of punishment and the way uh, justice is handed out and the laws applying to it are really problematic. Um, and, and he goes on and talks about um, other kinds of issues having to do with the economic system, um, with um, agrarianism and um, there's a, a discussion of sheep and, and how much, you know, the, the fact that sheep destroy so much land that farmers don't destroy. Um, and those were actually really kind of hotly debated questions at the time uh, about how to use land um, because of the, the amount of land that you would need to have if you had a big sheep herd where they would have to roam relatively widely and, and what they would do to the land versus uh, using the land for farming, what was more efficient, what was more effective, the kind of lifestyle that went with with um, having sheep versus um, versus having um, you know being a farmer and having uh, growing crops. Um, you even see this in the Bible um, in Genesis. Um, you see it um, also in Jefferson's day of his ideal citizen being a yeoman farmer, a single family farmer and the kind of lifestyle that went with being a farmer, you know, somebody who was self-reliant and a strong individualist and have these other kind of character traits that Jefferson, Jefferson really believed would make you an ideal citizen in a democracy, et cetera. So um, they talk about some of those sort of, of issues of economics and agrarianism as well. Um, and Haithla Day recounts one particular debate he had with uh, Archbishop John Morton about the question of punishment. Um, Archbishop John Morton, again, really did exist. He was somebody that young Thomas More actually worked for. Um, and I was able to find a picture. There, there are several of them, but this is a picture of, of Archbishop John Morton, um, who, was, again, was an advisor to Henry the, uh, the Seventh. Um, and um, 
height of day is critical again of these really harsh punishments in particular for stealing. And, and these are being defended in saying that, look, the harsher punishments you have, the more you're gonna keep people from stealing, right? Um, it's gonna be a deterrent from stealing um, and including putting people to death for stealing, right? So this is not about reforming people um, through imprisonment and some kind of uh, a process of making them think about what they did wrong and changing their ways. It was, you know, it was just basically saying, sorry, you know, you've, you've forfeited your right to live. Um, it didn't really help in terms of kind of remuneration for the person who had things stolen from them. It was basically just about being, you know, punished for what you did um, in a very harsh kinds of ways. And um, Heisler, they really found this problematic. It didn't seem like the punishment fit the crime. It didn't seem like, like a human way of treating people. One can imagine that Moore himself really was, uh, this is something that he really did believe in, that Heisler Day was, was touting, that these punishments were too harsh. Um, Heisler Day um, said, for example, if, um, if, you, if you kill somebody, if you, if you put them to death for stealing, what happens if they're caught in the act of stealing? Um, they are much more likely going to go ahead and try and murder the person who's catching them stealing rather than trying to flee the scene and potentially be caught by that person or be uh, or have that person um, actually, you know, um, be able to, to stop them and hold them and, you know, whatever. Um, if, if the, 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 the price of um, the punishment for thievery is having to pay back what you stole and do some other things. Um, but the, the punishment for murder is really harsh. You're not going to murder the person that, that maybe has caught you. You're going to, again, try and flee the scene or whatever. Um, however, you got nothing to lose. If you're going to be... Um, put to death for being a thief and somebody catches you, you might as well go ahead and try and kill that person so that they don't tell on you, right? So that um, um, you, there's not a witness of your thievery. Um, and so it did make sense to him to punish the, you know, somebody being a thief with that kind of a harsh crime because it kind of, it was a disincentive to not commit an even harsher crime uh, potentially, again, murdering somebody who maybe the person you're stealing from or somebody who catches you in trying to steal things. So this is an example that's that's used here. And so this is, it's, it's a very interesting debate that takes place here. And, and it's very thoughtful. And I, again, I more intentionally wanted to deal, I think, with some issues that he had concerns with and social problems at the time that really did exist, um, even though he didn't think that this fictional Utopia that Heifler Day visited had all the solutions. Um, he at least seemed to, to agree that some of the problems that were being discussed were things that really were indeed um, problematic about laws and, and other things at the time in England. Um, and it's in, the, it's in the course of Giles telling more, the character more in the book, um, uh, of, of, excuse me, Heifler Day telling Giles and Moore about this discussion that he had with John Morton and a lawyer um, that he gets into talking about a place that had better laws, better policies, better system of governance that he in fact visited. And he talks about actually having been on some of the early voyages of Amerigo Vespucci, who I supposedly discovered America, given you, know, you can see in the the name Amerigo, and that on one of his uh, Amerigo's um, journeys, that he had been along on that journey. I think he, he talks about Brazil and some other places and actually um, decided to stay there rather than return. And that um, the people that he was staying with, um, these uh, people in this far flung land, um, actually gave him, um, um, you know, a boat and, and, and food, et cetera, what he needed to investigate the area. 
and it was when he was out doing his uh, kind of sailing around, et cetera, in this part of the world that, that he hadn't been to and that presumably nobody had been to before, that he discovered this utopia, right? So, um, of course, you would not want to say specifically where this utopia is located and make it a real place because people are going to think that you're talking about a place that actually existed. And obviously, this is no place. This does not actually exist. But he describes in detail this place, and and um, and Giles and and Moore say, um, you know, tell him um, we want to hear more about this utopia. It sounds fascinating. And um, book two is um, Heithla Day giving a description of all kinds of aspects of this place called Utopia. Um, it's again economic system, it's political system, it's education. Um, all kinds of facets of that society that presumably offer solutions to the problems that England is suffering from. That um, we can imagine that um, the Giles and Moore are both also also really concerned with. Now, one of the the final issues that they discuss before Heifle Day goes through this description in Book Two of this place called Utopia is the question of whether or not it's useful and worthwhile and even maybe safe to put yourself in the service of a prince or a king. Um, this of course is, is sort of prophetic in a very ironic and tragic way for, for Thomas More, who um, had to kind of think through this difficult question himself, uh, which is no doubt why he kind of brings this up, I think in Utopia, though he, couldn't exactly imagine maybe what was going to happen to him ultimately. Um, and his break from Henry VIII and um, being caught up in the Protestant Reformation, etc. Um, that he was aware of the fact that that you put yourself in a tenuous position when you put yourself in the service of a king or a prince, etc. And they tell Heifel that, you know, you should consider doing this. You're, you've got this great wisdom. You've got these great ideas. You've done this traveling. Um, why don't you consider doing this? And Heifel say, Heifel Day says, why would I want to do this? Either you have to falsify yourself and not really say what you really believe if you think that the person you're working for, this prince, king, etc., is going to have problems with your ideas or not agree with them. You either have to not say what you really believe or chance um, losing your job, chance being on the outs with, with that prince or king, et cetera. Um, and uh, maybe even potentially having your life be put in danger as ultimately happened to Thomas More, right? When he refused to be a yes man and said, no, I will not sign um, with this formal break from the church of, of Henry VIII and of England and saying that, that I no longer see the Pope as, as, as the one in charge, et cetera. Um, so um, it's sort of, it's fascinating that this discussion comes up in book one, um, that Moore himself eventually is going to be caught up in this. And, and who knows, maybe he could foresee, maybe he had already had some, some um, instances where he saw tensions and ideas that he held that were important to him, potentially getting him in trouble with Henry VIII or not, we don't know exactly. He did, he did some other writings where he, you know, talked about um, his concerns um, with um, Lutheranism and the Reformation. Um, and as he saw Henry VIII starting to move in that direction, you know, potentially he saw himself in this difficult situation. Um, but Heifel Day says, no, I wouldn't do this. Um, I'm not going to put myself in the position of either having to just agree with the, 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 the monarchy um, in which case I'm not any use or in saying what I really believe and potentially just being ignored or having my life put in danger, et cetera. Now, remember, we've had two previous people that we've discussed who also thought about this issue. And both of them really struggled with it. The first we know was Socrates, right? There are only a couple instances we know where Socrates really got involved in political affairs. Um, it mainly had to do with the Peloponnesian War. We know the time he really asserted himself when um, these admirals were, were uh, put on trial 
for not picking up these bodies of these Athenian sailors in the water uh, because he was not able to do so. Uh, it was not safe for him to do so, uh, but they had won this great victory. Um, but the Athenian people were really angry at these admirals and wanted them put to death and they eventually were put to death. Socrates supposedly was one of the only people that, that to kind of um, came to the defense of these admirals. Um, we also know that, that he was critical of the leadership of, of Athens in his day um, and would only indirectly, however, voice those criticisms through his critiques of um, the kind of education that the young leaders, uh, that the leaders, young children, young male children were going through at the hands of the sophists, right? Who were the sophists being the people who were, um, you know, you send your child to a sophist if you wanted them to learn to be powerful sp speakers, uh, to be able to acquire power um, and standing and an and important name for themselves, et cetera. Um, and it didn't come with any kind of values orientation. It was just, here are these skills that you can use to become a powerful person in the political scene in Athens. Um, and so we know Socrates uh, engaged a lot of these uh, young Athenian males in all kinds of questions about moral and ethical issues that he wanted them to, to be thinking about what we would call values, right? Uh, virtue, um, what does it mean to be virtuous? and indirectly critiquing the leaders of Athens as, as not being uh, very virtuous people. Um, and um, even in doing this sort of indirectly, he was put to death, right? Um, and, and, and in certain way kind of blamed for um, Athens' uh, defeat at the hands of the Spartans and their allies in the Peloponnesian War. The other was Boethius, right? In his Constellation of Philosophy, he's writing from prison thinking about um, his decision um, to, um, to work for Theodoric and to do the same thing, put himself in the position of potentially um, having to either falsify himself or say what he really believed and do what he thought was right and potentially get in trouble with his employer. And again, we know that that happened and that he was put to death for it. Um, so there was definitely some precedent, important historical precedent here for this, this, um, this is issue that no doubt somebody as well as Thomas More was aware of. And, and in fact, there are, are references to Plato in Utopia. Uh, so, um, and, and that's not surprising, right? Uh, since again, it became to be viewed in hindsight as the first great work of Utopian literature that is Plato's Republic. Um, there's another sort of famous individual who um, is interesting to sort of include in the discussion here um, and somebody else you might be aware of, and that's um, Machiavelli. Um, and Machiavelli wrote um, a very important work um, and I'm not able to find um, that photo for some reason right now. Um, but it was called The Prince, Machiavelli's The Prince. And it was um, essentially included guidance for new princes and royals um, about how they should um, handle themselves, um, how they can acquire and, and, and retain power, et cetera. Um, and so um, that's working in some ways kind of against the, the tradition of, of, of having a moral compass and having an anchor in your faith and in your beliefs and, and not willing to be willing to falsify yourself in your beliefs for political power, right? So we, we, we even use that word Machiavellian talking about people being described as Machiavellian, right? If they're people who are out for power and, and are not necessarily care about what they do to get there, whether or not they, um, they lie or do other things to acquire power and maintain power, right? We can sometimes describe politicians as being Machiavellian. Um, and so that's another um, um, interesting kind of historical uh, linkage here. Um, so I had already talked about you know, making sure that we didn't sort of presume that um, everything 
that Heifel Day is describing utopia that more the author and even the more character necessarily agree with. Um, so again, remember that um, as you continue in reading book two, but at the same token, um, again, I think more definitely held some of the same kind of concerns with English society um, of his own day and some of the things that he found problem problematic about it. Um, one of the potential issues too that um, I think readers often become aware of in, in reading um, Utopia is this problem about how, you know, how do you, how would you apply uh, the, this utopia? If you wanted to try and, and reform England into a place like this utopia, how would you do it? And you kind of run into a paradox in that to create that kind of society, right? The people need to be a certain way, right? They need to be non-prideful, non-greedy. They have to put the social good before them. And you'll see this when you read book two and the kind of society that's being described. Uh, it's very much a communitarian society. In fact, it's, it's, it's a, another example of an early society we would kind of call um, a certain kind of pre-modern vision of a, of a communist sort of society. Um, the people need to already have those kind of character traits to create the institutions of utopia. But those institutions need to already exist to make people that way, to make them non-prideful and non-greedy and, and to make them dedicated to the social good, uh, to make them um, see the limitations of you know, amassing individual wealth and of, of what we call conspicuous consumption that's tied in with greediness and pridefulness, et cetera. Um, and in fact, you know, in any society that's trying to, to make major changes, you run into those problems, right? Um, at best, these changes come about very gradually. You have to have a generation of adults who see their society as flawed and enough of them who agree to start educating young people differently with different values and beliefs. Again, about um, the good life, about the government, about the various institutions in their society. And um, to have them start to gradually um, sort of bring about change. Right. I mean, the adults can certainly take a first step, but their children then need to take that next step. Um, and then they will educate their children. Right. And, and push those ideas, those new ideas even farther. And then eventually you can you know, gradually reform society. Um, but it's sort of impossible to imagine a set of adults who are in, in, in positions of power in a society right, members of government in high office or of very wealthy people who would say our society is completely bankrupt and it's, it's uh, flawed and we need to change things and, and re remake our society, right, uh, radically reconstruct it in some way. Um, one reason they wouldn't do that is because um, it was society, society being structured the way it was that got them in those positions of power and authority in the first place. So why are they going to want to change those things, right? Doesn't make sense. Kind of pulling the rug out from under yourself. They're also um, not likely to actually consider and embrace those ideas if they're so different than the ideas under which they were brought up in. And again, were able to be kind of be successful in, right? If, um, you were successful with the rules of the game that existed as you were being brought up. Why are you going to want to change those rules of the game once you're adults in power in a society? Much less want to change the game itself, right? Uh, which would be to, again, radically rethink the values and the beliefs and the goals of that particular sort of society, right? Um, so of, of course you can't just kind of instantly make those kinds of, of changes. There have been times in history when political leaders have attempted to make radical changes. Um, you do see this in certain communist societies. You can see it um, certainly in the communist revolution in China, 
uh, and also to a certain extent in the Soviet Union. And we know, you know what kind of disasters those turned out to be um, and that the people in charge didn't actually embrace those ideas themselves. Um, they actually ended much more like ended up themselves much more like fascists than, than, than communists. Um, but that is a question any society has to kind of answer um, and, and deal with. If it comes to recognize that um, it needs to change things, maybe because it's, it's lost its economic competitiveness, how does it change those things? It can do things to change its uh, policies when it comes to the economy and when it comes to trade and those kinds of things. But it also probably is going to need to, to educate the next generation, maybe to have different kinds of, of skills, right? This happens to the, in the, during the Cold War in this country when there starts to be more focus on educating people in math and science to develop the technologies and understand the science to fight the Cold War, develop military technologies. That same emphasis on, on math and science um, was sort of retained after World War II um, when um, the, the economy in particular of Japan, which had to totally obviously remake itself after all the destruction it suffered during World War II, uh, started to really become very competitive and it's a challenge the US in terms of its economy. And um, a lot of that had to do with industries um, also um, dealing with um, electronics industry, with automobile industry, things again for which people believe we need to have more engineers, more you know electrical engineers, um, people to make automobiles, et cetera. So math and science retained their superior position as the most important school subjects, et cetera. So you can see how you do this kind of generationally, gradually, but it's very difficult to, to, to again, remake a, a society. Um, there's another great example of this um, historically uh, that was kind of, um, I mentioned because it was a, an era of utopianism. And that was what's known as the progressive era, in particular, the progressive era in the United States and the late 1800s, early 1900s, where there was also a kind of utopianism um, in the air, as it were, um, part of the kind of zeitgeist of the era uh, was this idea that we can use these newly developing social sciences um, to create a better society and maybe even a perfect society or something close to it through things like social engineering, right? Um, using the science of, of psychology, including social psychology, of anthropology, of political science, of sociology, right? These were the new social sciences that were de developing at the time that didn't exist beforehand, that when they first developed were using the same methods as the natural sciences and which were designed for prediction and control when it comes to nature, right? So um, if you could do the same thing with human beings, you could, you through social engineering create these perfect kinds of societies. Um, and, and again, make the US a utopian kind of society. Uh, there were other things going on that contributed to that utopianism, that progressivism, um, um, new, new ways of treating, of treating poverty, of treating crime, ways that were more humanitarian, of treating alcoholism. Um, science was starting to develop inoculations against um, you know, childhood diseases and those kinds of things. So there were, there were other reasons for this utopianism. Um, ultimately, a lot of that utopianism was really destroyed by World War I and World War II. And I would say especially World War I. Um, this huge bloody war that did nothing but pave the way for World War II, kind of set the table for World War II with the grievances of in particular the German people um, after World War I where they felt like their government had kind of stabbed them in the back, uh, that they could have still won that war. The Treaty of Versailles, uh, where they had to, to give up so much, including some of their land. Um, and it really, uh, they thought it, 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 it really, um, they paid too much and too heavy a price, they thought, for World War I in, in that treaty and what they gave up in that treaty. 
and their treat treatment subsequent to that treaty. And of course, that's what allowed somebody like uh, Adolf Hitler and his kind of nationalism, ex extreme nationalism to really kind of come to power. Um, um, and, and so, as I said, I think World War I really, um, World War II kind of continued along the same uh, the same direction because it again grew out of World War I and was again a huge bloody war. Um, if you look at writing in between World War I and World War II and the arts, you can see um, this kind of, of this dismay of, of, of um, starting to believe that um, we thought human nature could be perfected and maybe it can't. Maybe we have these fundamental flaws that we're always gonna have wars and we're always gonna mistreat each other and we're always gonna have violence and greed, et cetera. And so, but, you know, before World War I, you get all this optimism and utopianism um, and you start to get more what we eventually called right, dystopian um, kind of attitudes. And again, you can see it in literature and the arts. Um, and um, there's a, a movement in, in art called Dada, which was really sort of um, almost trying to make fun of human beings and thinking how superior they were and, and, and how intelligent they were and the knowledge that they had about uh, the world and how to create perfect societies and, and that sort of thing and kind of threw it back in their face. Um, and then we have World War II coming along um, and, um, and then we get these dystopian novels that eventually um, are developed. And we, can, we first have, um, as an example of one of the early, um, more modern utopian pieces of literature, uh, we have B.F. Skinner's Walden Two. Some of you might be familiar with it, right? Thoreau's Walden was Walden One, a kind of vision of um, that maybe was idealistic of of this uh, very kind of um, communal society that Thoreau was living in, that um, that he found to be a society where people could really be authentic and be themselves, and where they could kind of be away for certain kinds of corruption that were occurring in the larger society and, and really have, have genuine kinds of neighbors and, and, and a genuine kind of society where they were not focused on trying to, again, on trying to have more than the other person had, et cetera. Um, and so B.F. Skinner believed that you could condition people through behavior psychology. And, and B.F. Skinner is most known, right, for behavior psychology. Um, along with, with Watson and, and also a guy named Thorndike. Um, but Skinner was the one who really kind of pushed um, behaviorist psychology to the point of kind of imagining that you could develop an ideal society through behaviorism, through a kind of, of um, society and education system that would condition people essentially to do the right thing to be good people, to have the, the right kinds of beliefs and, and values and to behave the right kind of way, right? Um, reading it today, and it kind of looks dystopian, looks extremely controlling. It's really, it can look very disturbing, especially if you're somebody like myself, who is, is um, not a fan of behaviorist um, theory. Um, but a lot of people at the time viewed it as an example of, of a utopian society. And certainly Skinner did, right? Of, of what an ideal might look like that would apply this new um, science of psychology and in particular the behaviorist variant of that new science of psychology to create an ideal society. Um, after you know, World War I and, and then later World War II, uh, we have the famous dystopian novels, right? Uh, maybe most famously, uh, George Orwell's 1984, which was written, remember, in, in 1948, not too long after the end of World War II. Um, Big Brother is watching you on the, the cover of this particular edition of, of 1984. Um, that, um, you know, you, you have to read really as a dystopian novel. Um, unless you have some very strange kind of uh, beliefs. And as, as well as 1984, um, you also have Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. 
as a very important, um, again, this piece of dystopian literature. Um, so this, this tradition of, of, of utopian thinking, of imagining better societies, ideal societies. Again, we can trace it all the way back to Plato's Republic. Um, and, and certainly the next really great piece of utopian literature is, is Moore's Utopia. Um, and we can find even more modern examples in, in Skinner's work, maybe to an extent in Thoreau's Walden, depending on how you read it. Um, and then the dystopian tradition uh, that kind of grew out of um, the belief that this kind of humanism and, and a kind of science of humanism in the late 1800s and early 1900s in, in certainly Western cultures um, and very much you can see it in this country, um, were really naive. They really thought, they either really thought that, that human nature is really good and that you can maintain that goodness in human nature, which was a fairly romantic belief, or that you could shape human beings from a young age to, uh, to be good people fundamentally. Um, and um, that essentially human nature was neutral. It could go both ways, which means it's possible to like be, Skinner would say in condition people to be, to be good. And again, to create ideal societies. Um, so I wanted to just make sure that that, that kind of um, tradition, the, the tradition of utopianism, utopianist thinking, what kind of happened to it historically as we move into the late 19th, early 20th century, I think is, is sort of important here. Um, but again, in, in talking about thinking about Moore's utopia, um, I think rather than see it as something that's written to get people to believe that they can actually create a society like that utopia that's described there, that I think you'll, you'll be able to see being aware of it pretty clearly um, has some, some serious flaws that it's hard to imagine more the author wouldn't have also seen as flaws. Nonetheless, it ad does address real social problems that again, Moore was concerned with, no doubt Giles and other humanists were concerned with at the time. Um, and those are worth you know, paying serious attention to. So um, that's my introductory lecture on Moore's Utopia. I hope you found it helpful. I know book one is a little bit of an odd read um, because of the, the way it's formatted. Um, and I hope you found this helpful as we move on then and read book two and also the discussion questions that go along with book two. Um, so um, have a good week. As always, if you have any questions about my lecture or about the discussion questions or the reading, please feel free to let me know.